In this series, I'm putting together a video graphics controller based on the Z80 microprocessor. And in the last video, I was able to get a picture of 256 by 192 pixel resolution to display on the screen. The idea being to use all the tricks and techniques Sir Clive and his group of engineers in Cambridge used to get the ZX81 to be so cheap. This is a block diagram of the design so far but we're way over our budget on memory usage. The image alone takes up 6 kilobytes, and both the ZX80 and ZX81 came out with 1 kilobyte of memory each. And that was for everything, including the display. What I'm planning to go over in this video is how these machines used a character set stored in the ROM to reduce the main memory requirements. While the Z80 thinks it's executing no ops, the image to display on the screen is being fetched out of the main memory. We've gone over the instruction cycle for NOAP before, which includes both the instruction fetch from memory and the refresh phase where the CPU itself is performing the decode and execute required for the instruction. Now, the NOAP instruction is pretty straightforward, and not much changes in the CPU. The only major state changes are in the program counter and the memory refresh register, which are both incremented by one. I need to talk about memory refresh in more detail, and in my humble opinion, the use of the memory refresh register to reduce the size of the text frame buffer is one of the greatest innovations of the 8-bit era. It almost sounds ridiculous saying it, but that's what they've done, and I'll go over it in this video and the next. I even think it beats Steve Wozniak's use of artifact color for the Apple II. Seven bits of the memory refresh register are automatically incremented after each instruction fetch. Then, during the refresh cycle, the value stored in the memory refresh register is put on the address lines A0 through A7, and the value stored in the interrupt vector register is outputted on A8 through A15. So, why does the Z80 have a memory refresh register in the first place? I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here for a moment, but please bear with me. There are basically two types of memory in common use, static RAM or SRAM, and dynamic RAM or DRAM. Static RAM is essentially a latch, and you can think of it as being like these two inverters, where the output of each inverter drives the input of the other inverter. There's also some switches which can override the value already stored. If the first switch is closed, then the input to the leftmost inverter becomes 5 volts, its output goes to zero, this then becomes the input for the second inverter on the right, and its output goes to 5 volts. That 5 volts then feeds back to the input on the left inverter. Now, if the top switch is opened, the circuit remembers that the last input was 5 volts. This is how a single bit stored. At some point later in time, when the bottom switch closes, the input on the leftmost inverter goes to 0. Its output goes to 5 volts. The output of the second inverter goes to 0, and this feeds back to the first inverter. Then, sometime later, when the bottom switch is opened, the previous 0 output is preserved. This circuit will basically keep the information stored as long as power is applied. The main drawback, though, is that most static RAM models require 6 transistors per bit, so they're relatively expensive to implement. Dynamic memory, on the other hand, is implemented as a capacitor, and the charge stored on the capacitor represents state. So, if the top switch closes and the capacitor charges to 5 volts, that'll stay there temporarily. Similarly, if the capacitor happens to be at 5 volts, and the bottom switch closes, it'll go down to zero quickly. The problem is, this capacitor isn't perfectly isolated, and its charge will eventually leak through the silicon substrate which I've represented here as a resistor. So what happens when we close the top switch is that the capacitor charges up to 5 volts, but it won't hold that charge for very long, and eventually it'll dissipate. I've built this circuit on a breadboard. We can see that when we charge it up initially, it goes to 5 volts, but over time it starts to fade. What this means, if we want to preserve the charge on the capacitor, we constantly need to recharge it back to 5 volts so we don't lose the data stored. We need to keep doing this again and again and again, and we have to keep doing this for as long as we want the information to be stored. 
This set of capacitors can be set up to form a large two-dimensional array, and this is how we make our dynamic memory chips. Importantly, they're very high density because we only have one transistor per bit. The downside is the constant need to refresh the memory. This is a die shot from the famous 4116 16 kilobit dynamic RAM from Ken Shiris blog page. I'll provide links below. One saving grace for refresh is that we can refresh more than one bit at a time. In fact, these chips are designed so that we can refresh an entire row of memory cells in parallel. During the refresh portion of our instruction cycle, the memory refresh address tells the dynamic RAM which row of the memory needs to be read and written back. This means we refresh one row at a time for every instruction we execute on the Z80. As the memory refresh register count increments, we slowly scan through the chip from top to bottom. This process occurs continually while the Z80 is operating. Now, when it's just executing no ops, we can actually sweep through the entire memory in about two and a half scan lines, which takes about 160 microseconds. Obviously, more complex instructions will cause refresh to slow down a little, but provided we refresh the entire memory within two milliseconds, it should stay happy. So why does this matter at all, given that we know the ZX80 and ZX81 use static RAM chips? What gives? Well, we're going to hijack the refresh system in this video to help us display text. And in the next video, we're going to use the refresh counter to help us generate HSync and reduce the memory footprint for the text frame buffer. At the moment, the way the system works is that we have a text frame buffer of 32 by 24 characters. Each character requires one byte in memory and is displayed in an 8 by 8 pixel format. This brings the text frame buffer requirement down to 768 bytes. We read a character from the frame buffer, and then we do a lookup into our character set ROM to figure out what the bit pattern should be. Now, there are eight individual bytes that make up a character, and so we need some way of figuring out which bit pattern we should be using. For that, we have this line counter, which is incremented by the HSync pulse. This counter only tells us which of the eight patterns to use, so it only needs to be three bits wide. Using a combination of the character itself and the line number, we look up the bit pattern and send it to the shift register, where it's serialized and shifted out to the video circuit one pixel at a time. During the instruction fetch part of the cycle, we do a memory read, but instead of sending it to the shift register, I'm going to implement another octal D type flip flop to store this data which I'm going to call the character register. This is just used for short-term storage of the character we've read from memory. Now, here's the tricky bit. I'm going to use the previously unused refresh phase of the instruction cycle to do the character set bitmap lookup. But instead of seeing the memory refresh address, I want the index into the memory to be based on the character register and the line counter. During the refresh phase, we do another main memory read, but this time we store the output in our shift register. I'm going to need to rewire the address lines into our EEPROM, but rather than rewiring the existing EEPROM, I'll leave this ZIF socket in place empty and I'll add in a second ZIF socket for the new EEPROM. This time, the upper six bits of the address bus, A9 through A14, come from the Z80, but I'm going to need to do something else for the bottom nine bits. Next, I'm going to add in our new character register and our new line counter. The character register is a 74HC374 octal D type flip flop, and the line counter is just a simple 74HC161, which we've already used in our clock circuit. What I need now is a way of selecting either the lower 9 bits from the Z80 address bus or the 9 bits generated by our character register and line counter. The chip I'm going to use for this is the 74HC257, which is a quad 2 input multiplexer. It has an output enable signal, and when that's high, the chip is effectively disconnected. It has two sets of inputs and one set of outputs, and when the output enable is asserted, it'll select between one of the two input sets. When pin 1, the select signal is low, one group of inputs is routed to the output, in this case, the Z80 address lines coming from the CPU will go to the output from the multiplexer, which then goes onto the EEPROM. But when the select input's high, 
the data from the character register and line counter will go through to the address lines of the new EEPROM. To switch between all nine address lines simultaneously, I'm going to actually need three of these multiplexer chips. I always have the output enabled in this circuit, so I can actually use either 74HC157s or 74HC257s. So why did I use the 257s? I just happen to have a lot of them on hand for another project. Now let us have a look at the data flow during the first half of the instruction cycle, where we're doing the instruction fetch from main memory. The Z80 will be outputting the address for the instruction, and we select the multiplexer to let the upper address pathway go through to the EEPROM. The knob generator is turned on, and that will force 00, 00 hexadecimal, which is the knob instruction, into the Z80. The EEPROM then outputs its character information. This gets stored in the character register, and because of our bank of resistors, this will be prevented from significantly interfering with the NOOP instruction. Next, we move to the refresh phase of the instruction cycle, and the multiplexer selects the lower address pathway, which is the character register and line counter. This address is presented to the character set information stored in the EEPROM, and the associated bit pattern for that character and line is latched into our shift register and then sent to the display. But how do we know the upper address lines, A9 through A14, will be pointing at the character set during the refresh cycle? Well, remember that the processor outputs the contents of the interrupt register to address lines A8 through A15 during reset. In the case of the ZX80, the character set information is stored at E00 hexadecimal, so there's some code that's executed just after reset that loads 0E hexadecimal into our interrupt register. In the case of the ZX81, the character set is stored at location 1E00 hexadecimal, so we load 1E into the interrupt register instead. Very clever. It means that we can potentially use other character sets than the one defined, and I suspect this is how some of the games work that appear to be using high resolution. The system performs a character lookup, followed by a bit pattern lookup, but we need to change the circuitry for loading the shift register. Instead of loading it at the end of T2, we want to load it at the end of T4. We can use a flip-flop to delay our refresh bar signal, then we can use refresh bar, delayed refresh bar, and clock bar to form our shift register load signal. Let's see how this impacts our schematic diagram. I've removed the original EEPROM from the diagram for now, and I'm going to add in another one further to the left. I add in the line counter and character register. All of these new signals now need to pass through a 2 to 1 multiplexer before they go to the EEPROM. For now, this means that the text frame buffer and the character set are both stored in the EEPROM, but eventually we're going to want to store the text frame buffer in static RAM but we'll worry about that in the next video. The next question is, can we find these components in our original ZX80 schematic diagram? The line counter is here in the form of a 74LS93. Our new character register is represented by a 74LS373 on the Z80 schematic diagram. Finally, the 2 to 1 multiplexes are here in the form of three 74LS157s. This is the new socket for the line counter, and I've already installed the character register and the three multiplexers. Now I'm going to add in a ZIF socket for the new EEPROM. I have some plans for the old ZIF socket, but we'll just leave it empty for now. Next, I need to do some wiring. I'll hook up the data lines to our new EEPROM. address lines, and if you remember from the last video, you might have seen me already wiring up the multiplexer and character register. Now for the moment of truth, does it work? Picture yourself in a boat on a river. Excellent. Some of you might remember this old style ZX80 text font. How do we deal with the character generator in software? On the left, we see the original code which we used in the first video. Next, I move to a port based combined sync, which I'll go over in more detail in the next video. On the right, we see the code for text generation. Essentially, we loop over the same line eight times, which is shown in this panel. But once we hit the bottom of the character, we need to jump to the next line. <laughs> 
The B register keeps track of the line within the text row, and once we've gone through a complete cycle, it gets reloaded with the number 8, which is stored in the D register. Note that all of these paths take exactly 208 clock cycles. We're getting closer to the final design, and it's starting to resemble a ZX80. But there are a few more things I need to do before I can just put in a ZX80 ROM and expect it to run. That's it for now, and I'll see you in the next video.